Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's inventory Saturday night, April the 11th. Two intriguing fights. This is going to be a very hard night of boxing to be, just from an intrigue standpoint. Right? Let's talk about my two predictions. Let's talk about why both of those predictions were wrong. Right? The casino beat me up more than any of these fighters this weekend got beaten up. Right? My first prediction was that someone would get knocked out in the Peter Quillen versus Andy Lee fight. Right? Both guys went down. Heavy punches were landing. Right? Officially, I believe Andy Lee goes down twice, although I'd question the second knockdown. But both guys showed a lot of heart, and that fight went the distance. Then, of course, I took Lamont Peterson, a plus 275 underdog, over unbeaten champion Danny Garcia. Right? Both of these guys had belts. Right? That fight ended in a majority decision. We'll talk about it. Let me say this first. Of the four fighters on the card, right? Quillen, middleweight champion Lee, and Danny Garcia unbeaten, and Lamont Peterson, in my opinion, the fighter with the most talent the best set of skills is the guy who lost Lamont Peterson we'll talk about it that doesn't mean necessarily that I think that he won the fight let's go to the Andy Lee Peter Quillen fight now let me say this as you look at the fight for everyone here online and there are millions of us who try to predict fights you know, what really caught me with this fight was the fact that there's a lack of foot speed with both guys, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Both of these guys are championship level. Both of these guys have held the middleweight title. But there's a lack of foot speed with both of these guys. In fact, if you consider boxing to be a full body sport, if you're looking not just above the waist at things like hand speed and upper body movement, but if you're looking below the waist on things like foot speed, foot work, right, uh, angles, using your feet, then just understand that this fight between Lee and Quillen really had two punchers, two guys who really rely on leverage and power what it didn't have was foot speed. What it didn't have was lateral movement. Neither guy is on the balls of their feet, right? There's no bounce below the waist. This is an upper body fight, right? Both guys are flat footed. In fact, it's interesting, right? You have an orthodox fighter, Quillen, against Southpaw Lee. And there are moments in this fight where the guys recognize each other's power and they just stand there and look at each other, right? Literally, they're afraid to make a move. Neither guy thinks to move laterally, to open up space, to create opportunities, right? These guys are punchers. They think like punchers. That's one of the reasons why the sport is so great, because it's rock, paper, scissors, right? These are punchers who, I'm sure, don't think to work behind a jab and movement, right? Who are accustomed to being hunters, not the hunted. 
it costs one of them in this fight. Now let me backtrack a little bit by way of analogy. Let's say that you're a cop and you stop a guy in a car on a suspected DUI. Let's say he gets out the car, right? And you're looking at him and he looks drunk to you. He looks buzzed to you. I'm telling you, many cops would then give the guy a test, not necessarily a breath test, right? But what they might do is they'll talk to the guy. They'll ask him where he was. Then they'll ask him where he is, right? They're looking for things like slurred speech, dim reaction, blurred memory. Some might even ask the guy to say the alphabet. Right? The idea is to test the guy. You suspect that the guy is drunk. You're going to test the guy to see how buzzed he is, whether he's coherent. Now, early in this fight, Peter Quillen drops Andy Lee. Drops him. Andy Lee gets up. Folks, he's gone. Right? He's so gone that a key moment in this fight, and it's a key moment, comes when the ref, who did an outstanding job, looks at him and talks to him. It's a key moment. Because if the ref pulled the plug at that point, nobody could have argued. Right? Andy looks out. Right? You know the rest. The ref looks at him and looks carefully at him. Look at the ref's eyes. Right? Andy Lee looks dead. Looks like he can barely stand. It's so bad that when Peter Quillen comes back over to him, there's still a little bit of time left in the round. Quillen opens up a bit, and Andy Lee looks like he falls into the ring apron. Looks like he can't stand up and box. Right? I believe that's the end of the first round. It's the first or second round. Andy Lee's dead in the water. He's drunk just like a guy. At a DUI stop, he's buzzed, he's dazed, he's confused, right? I'm guessing if you gave Andy Lee a test at that moment, he's not going to do as well as he would do if he's alert. So then we get to the next round. Here's the problem. Peter Quillen's flat-footed, right? Peter Quillen prefers to move slow. He's a big middleweight. Right? One would have hoped, if you believe, that Andy Lee has been buzzed in the previous round and is operating at less than 100%. One would have hoped that Peter Quillen would come in and would at least throw a jab. Keep him busy. Test him. Force Andy Lee to think. Just like a cop would say, say the alphabet for me. Right? Force a guy who's buzzed to think. Right? Ask the guy, hey, I've stopped you. Um, what road are we on? What time is it? Right? Force the guy to reveal his level of awareness. Peter Quillen does none of that. Right? Quillen's so addicted to throwing big punches. Right? Getting close enough to a guy and throwing big punches that he's not of the mindset of shooting jabs to make a guy think, right? Moving around the ring to make the guy actually wonder, where is he, right? So Quillen, of course, lets the opportunity pass because I'm sure in Quillen's mind, given his KO percentage, he had ample time to finish off Andy Lee, right? I was dumbfounded. I was absolutely dumbfounded, right? Both of these guys, just as an aside, right? And the fight is ruled a draw, right? Andy Lee knocks down Quillen later, right? Quillen actually knocks Andy Lee down a second time, but it looked to me like their feet got tangled, right? So both guys are landing big punches, but there's never a sense of urgency in the fight. Quillen goes down for the first time in his career. When he gets back up, I don't see Andy Lee run across the ring and try to empty the gun. Now, just from a fight handicapping standpoint, to me, 
both of these guys would be vulnerable to a guy with lateral movement, with a jab, who can operate on the balls of his feet, right? A guy who's less methodical, a guy who's higher volume, right? Both of these guys would have problems with a mover. Now, Quillen famously fought Hassan and Jikam. Of course, Quillen won it the way Quillen does, with several knockdowns. I would argue that the secret to beating Qu Peter Quillen, who remains an unbeaten fighter, is in the rest of that fight. When Hassan and Jikam is not hitting the floor, right? He's actually up and he's outboxing Peter Quillen. I thought the Lee Quillen fight was noteworthy for really the inability of either guy to make his legs an issue. The inability of either guy to really move. Don't get me wrong. This is a big part of boxing where guys look at each other and, you know, plan power shots. That's fine, right? All I'm saying is the secret sauce that makes you great in boxing is also your Achilles heel. The fact that Andy Lee and Peter Quillen are big hitters with both hands is also the handicap that makes them vulnerable against faster-handed, better-moving boxers. Let's talk about the uh, Lamont-Peterson fight. Now, this is an interesting fight. I'll say this. I know there are many people here online, many, who have made videos saying that Lamont Peterson was robbed. Right? You can imagine, since the odds on Peterson were almost 3 to 1, and since I was shilling for Peterson before the fight, right, I thought this fight had the opportunity for an upset. You can imagine how much I would want to be able to say here that Lamont Peterson won the fight, right? Obviously, my wallet would have felt a lot better. Instead, I'm a lot poorer, right? I've worn torn up shirts like this. Well, look, let me say this. I sat down, I scored the fight. Now, some rounds are close, right? Forget the crowd momentum. I understand that the crowd, by the end of the 12th round, is rooting for Lamont Peterson, right? They sense the swing in the fight. They're on their feet, right? I understand the crowd early on is cheering for Danny Garcia. By the way, that's how good a fight it was. It was a brilliant fight. Let me say this. In my opinion, the first round and the 12th round could have gone either way. Right? As you're looking at that 12th round, and I understand Danny Garcia's game is not being on his back foot, but Danny Garcia on his back foot really delivers a performance in that 12th round. Right? I'm just saying, he himself understood that he had lost several of the preceding rounds. And I thought just courage-wise, right? Everything you need to know about Danny Garcia's level of courage is on display in that 12th round. I thought that 12th round was too close to call. Right? I thought the first round, not a lot happens in that first round. Right? Garcia is the pursuer. Lamont Peterson, more complicated fighter than either Quillen or Andy Lee. Lamont Peterson is actually a switch. So, he's better on the inside than Danny Garcia. He's better on the outside than Danny Garcia. Danny Garcia is an A-plus mid-range hooker. Right? What this fight's all about, in my opinion, is what happens when a mid-range hooker can't get in mid-range. Right? Peterson keeps Danny Garcia out of mid-range. Now, the first round's interesting because Danny is coming forward thinking it's going to be his regular fight. Peterson's moving around the ring, doesn't spend time in the pocket. He's on the outskirts of the pocket. Now, if you believe Peterson wins the first round, the idea is, hey, didn't he make Danny Garcia 
look uncomfortable. Didn't he take Danny Garcia out of his comfort zone, right? You know Garcia wants it mid-range. Lamont Peterson is playing games with distance, right? So you would say ring generalship. Let's talk about scoring boxing for a moment. You would say from a ring generalship standpoint, Lamont Peterson wins the first round. But in terms of a who is pursuing the action, right? Who's the guy who's trying to create the fight and who's the guy who's trying to avoid the fight? There's an argument in that first round for Danny Garcia. Now, if, as I do, you believe the first round could have gone either way, and if, as I do, you believe the 12th round could have gone either way, let's just say I gave Danny Garcia the second round, the fourth round, the fifth round, the sixth round, and the seventh round, right? So I gave Danny Garcia five rounds. I gave Lamont Peterson the third round, right? The eighth round, the ninth round, the tenth round, and the eleventh round. So this is that proverbial fight that could have gone either way. As much as it pains me to say this as someone who would have hit on an underdog, a plus 275, and would have gotten a win in the first loss of Danny Garcia's career. I cannot criticize the judges for the way they came down in this fight. It's clear at the end of the fight that Lamont Peterson has dominated the second half of the fight. The million dollar question is whether he did enough in the first half of the fight, right, to actually add to what he did in the second round of the fight. Let me say this. You know, I'm someone who believes, just the way I look at boxing, that Pernell Whitaker beat Julio Cesar Chavez. I believe Pernell beat Oscar De La Hoya. I believe one of the best rounds of boxing I have ever seen in my life is the very first round of that first Ali Liston fight. And keep in mind, in that fight, Ali hardly throws any punches in the first round. Hardly any. Now, one of the secrets to boxing, it's one of the problems of boxing, is the fact that, you know, we're all scoring using different criteria. In track and field, everyone's looking at the stopwatch, right? Everyone's looking at the finish line. You look on the stopwatch and you say, you know, this guy just ran 9-7, 100 meters, right? He beat the guy who ran a 9-7-5, 100 meters. We'll all agree on that, right? It's a stopwatch. It's time. That's how you determine the winners in track and field. In boxing, it's a little bit more nebulous, isn't it? Right now, I was watching the Box Nation feed, and it's clear the Barry guy on Box Nation loves a front foot fighter. Right, he's a guy who looked at the first round and thought, you know what, Garcia is the guy on his front foot. Right, Garcia is the guy who wants the action. Let me say this: in the fourth round of the fight, and keep in mind, I consider the third round to be a masterpiece for Lamont Peterson. As I watch that third round, I'm laughing. Peterson looks that good to me, right? Part of boxing, as I see it, is making the other guy miss, right? When I see Danny Garcia trying to throw body shots in the third round and he can't even land body shots, right? Peterson's walking around the ring. He's making a miss. He's hitting him back with a jab. I'm laughing, the round's so lopsided. But I can tell you that in the fourth round, Danny Garcia puts his hands up. He waves at Peterson. He's like, hey, I'm here. You know, you're going to come fight. The crowd, after looking at a round that I thought was a great round for Peterson, the crowd cheers. They want to see a fight. They weren't impressed 
by Lamont Peterson's brilliant movement. They weren't impressed by his ring generalship. Understand, I named two Purnell fights. Understand that the first fight against Chavez is ruled a draw. The fight against De La Hoya, the judges awarded the victory to De La Hoya. Folks, those are two of the best defensive fights I've seen in my life. So here, just to understand the boxing community is not united. You have a fight that all of us need to look at. We need to put it in a time capsule, right? The fight really reflects the boxing community more than anything else. What I can tell you without any doubt in my mind is that Lamont Peterson is the harder fighter to fight. He's the guy with the multiplicity of skills who can beat you outside the pocket and can actually come inside and beat you with an inside game. In the eighth round, he decides he's going to come inside on Danny Garcia. The rest of the fight is a mismatch. Right? Peterson is actually better up close than Danny Garcia. It's so bad that Garcia, a front foot heavy guy, is on his back foot the last few rounds, right? You see that Peterson is better deep in the pocket. You understand that Garcia is brilliant at mid-range, right? At mid-range, it's a mismatch in Garcia's favor. Garcia is so dangerous at mid-range that Peterson stays outside the first half of the fight. He doesn't want to deal with a rested Danny Garcia. It's only when Garcia gets tired, right, that Peterson then steps in, right? In the interim, Peterson is moving around the ring, making Danny Garcia miss. Now, let me just say, the fight is close. Danny Garcia, at the end of the fight, says, I'm not going to lie, this was close. I agree with him. I have no beef, even though it cost me, right? I have no beef with the scoring in the fight. I cannot say that Lamont Peterson was robbed. I cannot, right? I've watched boxing long enough to understand that the same fight can be interpreted differently by people watching the fight. Right, so I'm watching the third round and I'm thinking, my God, Peterson is on his game. This is a masterpiece round. And then at the same time, understand it when Box Nation at the end of the round says, we give the round to Garcia, but the round easily could have gone the other way. Right? You know, I understand the full dynamic. Let's just say, though, that of the four men who entered the ring Saturday night, only one of them, right, used his lower body, used his legs. Let me just say, Peterson, in the later rounds, actually starts putting on a show. He starts throwing bolo punches in the ninth round. There are times where Garcia is throwing his hooks. Peterson ducks under his hooks, right? Then literally starts moving his legs, doing footwork routines. I'm not kidding. Footwork routines to let Garcia know, son, you're not going to catch me with those punches. If you want to see the genius of Peterson, and it's genius, what I want you to do is to look at when Danny leans forward and tries to throw a jab to Peterson's body. You're going to notice that Peterson is so coordinated, has his legs moving so well, has figured out spacing to such a degree that Peterson just leans his body back. Garcia can't even land the body punches. Now let's talk about what both guys could have been different, uh, could have done differently to tilt the scales in their favor a bit more, right? Because this fight really could have gone either way. 
for Danny Garcia. You know, Garcia's right hand lands with regularity at times, right? He's able to throw that right hand and land flush on Peterson. Peterson has his left time. Peterson has his shots to the body time. What Peterson doesn't seem to have timed, at least to these two eyes, is Danny Garcia's right hand up top to his head. Right? That's what he doesn't have time. If I'm Danny Garcia and I'm looking at the film of this fight, and it's a classic, right? It's a must watch. I would be asking myself why I didn't throw more of those right hands, right? Also, I would ask myself why I was so bad at cutting off the ring, right? The problem with Danny, and Danny before the fight said that he felt he was one of the pound for pound best fighters in the sport. Now you look at his resume and let me tell you, his resume is very impressive, right? He has wins over Amir Khan, Zab Judah, Eric Morales, Kendall Holt, and now Lamont Peterson, right? Mauricio Herrera, if you believe the scoring of that fight. The problem with Danny, though, is he looks too hardwired, right? He's an A-plus mid-range hooker. He's not that good when a guy gets inside mid-range. We saw that definitively in the last third of his fight. He's not that good when the guy's outside moving. He has a problem with movement, right? The question is, if a guy has a great resume and an unbeaten record, but has holes in his game, do you put him on the pound-for-pound -pound list knowing that he has holes in his game? Or do you favor someone who looks like they have more skills, but who have, have been in car crashes? Like Peterson's car crash involving Lucas Matisse. Right? Now for Peterson, let me say this. When you're dancing around the ring, I thought the fourth round's interesting because Peterson is too far from the pocket. He looks like Arislandy Lara in the fourth round. When you're dancing around the ring, you have to find a way to engage, don't you? Right? You have to find a way to at least land some shots, have some offense, so we understand that you're boxing and not running. Right? That in addition to your defense, there's some offense. I would encourage Peterson to consider throwing more jabs. You don't have to put yourself in harm's way. I believe his post-fight comments are the best, most revealing post-fight comments that I've read from a boxer this year. He talks about how if he pushed the ball up the court in the first half of the fight, he might have left himself vulnerable. Right? He, he might not have had the gas for the second half of the fight. He might have gotten hit, he might have gotten hurt. In other words, there was a pacing dynamic to his game. My point is simply, there are ways to land punches without putting yourself in the middle of the pocket. There are ways to deal with a mid-range hooker, right? That actually allows you to land some shots. I thought Peterson had the right balance in the third round. I thought he let it get away from him in the fourth round, right? Let's also talk charisma for a moment. Danny Garcia, for whatever reason, is the more charismatic fighter, right? When Danny waves at Peterson in the fourth round, the crowd is clearly on his side. Fighters need to be aware of that charisma gap. If you're fighting a charismatic fighter, a guy who the fans connect with for whatever reason, right? And keep in mind, Danny's not even a New Yorker. Danny's a Philly guy. In New York, the crowd was there for Danny. A guy like Lamont Peterson needs to realize that when he's fighting a more charismatic fighter, a tie goes to the charismatic guy, right? So he, he needs to up his volume in the rounds where he's being defensive, right? He needs to be on the outskirts of the pocket, not too far away from the pocket. In other words, with lateral movement, right, 
You want to at least make sure the fans believe and the judges believe that you're still in striking range. Right? There are times when Lamont Peterson gets a little bit too far away from the pocket. He looks like Eris Landy Lara looked against Canelo. Now, let me say, I personally believe Lara wins that fight. But I thought Peterson overdid the spacing here just a little bit. To sum up, I believe the fight, Garcia, Peterson, could have gone either way. I have no regrets, other than financial regrets, on picking Peterson over Garcia. In a rematch, I'd take Peterson. Because Peterson now has figured out, put it this way, the trend in the fight, the last third of the fight, is clearly all Peterson. Right? In other words, things are going Peterson's way. The momentum is with Peterson. I think when you have a technician, a boxer with a multiplicity of skills, when you have a switch, right? A Floyd, a Lamont Peterson, an Andre Ward, right? A guy who can fight you back foot or front foot. I believe those guys benefit the most from familiarity, right? Peterson knows Danny Garcia now, right? Danny Garcia's hot zone, his, his area of excellence, the breadth of his game is not as wide as Lamont Peterson's, right? Still, with that said, I can't complain about the scoring. Peterson left a lot on the table by myself. Gave Garcia the second round, the fourth round, the fifth round, the sixth round, and the seventh round. In other words, I gave Garcia rounds four through seven. I thought the seventh round's interesting because while Peterson seems to have the advantage on ring generalship, Garcia's in there landing the crisper punches. Right? That's how I see it. I understand the fight's controversial. I'll concede I'm poor today because of the fight. Let me hear from you. What did you see in the fight? If you're someone who believes there was a clear-cut winner either way. In fact, since the first fight was ruled a draw, the Quill and Lee fight. If you feel there was a clear-cut winner in either fight, tell us about it here in the comment section to this video. Let me also add something else. And it's important, it has to be mentioned, right? You know, Quillen, of course, blows weight. So the Quillen fight is not a title fight. If the title was on the line, don't you think late in that fight, both men would have been more courageous, right? Let's say you're Andy Lee. Let's say you've hit the canvas twice in the fight. It's late in the fight, right? I believe Andy Lee understood late in that fight that he didn't have to put the car in fifth gear because whether he's in fifth gear or fourth gear, whether he wins or loses, he's still going to leave the building with his title, right? He's not going to lose his title to Peter Quillen, right? Also, let's talk about Quillen for a moment. Right, Quillen is there. Um, doesn't there come a time where you understand, look, I'm not going to win the title tonight anyway. Right? What's the worst case for me? Keep in mind, Quillen goes down late in that fight. Right? Now, Quillen didn't get off the canvas thinking, oh man, I've just been knocked down. It's a close fight. For me to win this title, I've got to go all out. I've got to empty the gas tank. He didn't have to think that way because the title wasn't at stake. So a worst case for Peter Quillen in a close fight, if he fights cautiously, is that he loses by decision. Right? If he fights recklessly against a puncher, a worst case would have him getting knocked out. I got the feeling Quillen not making weight impacted how the last few rounds of that fight, which was up in the air, were fought by both guys. Anyway, that's my take. Let me hear yours. I hope you leave it here in the comment section to this video about both of the fights that took place on the PBC card on Saturday night, April the 11th, 2015. Thanks for stopping by.